Uh, hi, good afternoon. This is Rajiv, Rajiv S. Khanna from the law offices of Rajiv S. Khanna PC, immigration.com. This is our bi-weekly community conference call on immigration issues. As you logged into the web, to the conference call, you would have heard the disclaimers. This does not create attorney-client relationship and we are giving you information to the best of our ability. This is not a substitute for a one-on-one -on -one consultation uh, but we are trying to give you general guidelines as best as we can. I will go over first the frequently asked questions, what I believe are routinely recurring issues that people face. After that, I will go over the routine questions. We won't have time for new questions today because I think we are full up. Let's begin with the first question. This is from Jordan3184. So the issue is, if an employer creates problems <clears throat> in the H-1B salary, what should you do? <clears throat> the way H-1B process works, it's quite stringently administered by the U.S. Department of Labor, wage and hour division. So essentially what you need to do is, instead of trying to get yourself a private lawyer and trying to resolve this issue in courts, you just contact the wage and hour division, follow their instructions, file the complaint, any problem you have relating to payment, non-payment of salary or deduction from wages. Because it's interesting, H-1B laws are very tough about taking deductions from your salary, whether those deductions are based upon um, employers money owed or they're based upon any other reasons the only two types of deductions that are allowed from your salary one is if they are being done for your convenience employees convenience with the consent of the employee so if you tell the employer employer look i want you to take a hundred dollars a month off and put them aside um, in in my savings account that's fine but they cannot start deducting money from your salary. In fact, so much so that sometimes <clears throat> if you owe them money, they shouldn't be taking the money out of your salary, even if it were a loan. The proper way to do it is to give you your full paycheck and then ask for the money back. That said, your questions are, can my employer take bonus back as loan? And the answer is no. Absolutely not. Bring it up with the wage and hour division and do it quickly because I think they can go back only one year in time. If you are talking about 2016, it might already be too late for that. 2017 might be too late for that. But it doesn't, doesn't hurt to at least bring it up to the wage and hour division. If When you have gone out of time with the wage and hour division, you can always then have a lawyer file a private lawsuit. Different jurisdictions, different states have different times on how late you can file a lawsuit. Typically contract lawsuits can be filed up to five years later. So 2016 non-payment could be brought up in a lawsuit, but that's a state law issue you have to discuss with local lawyers. depends upon the amount you can talk to a local lawyer and see how much they would charge you and typically unless there is a contract that says if there's a litigation the loser will pay the attorney's fees for the winner you cannot get attorney's fees as a result of your deduct your uh, litigation so it's a good idea to talk with a local lawyer anyway can he withdraw my I-140? So the new regulations are, if your I-140 is approved and stayed approved for 180 days, any one of those days being passed January 17th, 2017, then you have nothing to worry about. Because after 180 days, even if they withdraw your I-140, you keep your priority date and you also keep the right to keep extending your H-1B with any employer. 
if they revoke your case after the I-140 is approved, but before 180 days of approval, you only lose your right to extend your H-1. You still keep your priority date. So it really, I don't see what they can do. You should definitely talk with a lawyer. See if they, if the filing a lawsuit, considering the amount that is due you, is worth it. But before that, talk with the Wage and Hour Division of the Department of Labor. If anybody has any follow-up questions on what I just discussed, press star 5 on your phone. Anyone has any follow-up questions on what I just discussed? Press star 5. Okay, let's go on to the next frequently asked question. This is an easy one. So I've got my green card approval. Can I take another part-time job to make some extra money? Absolutely. Why not? Once you get your green card approval, you can take as many jobs as you like. Can you also quit and just start something totally new? And the answer is probably, as long as it does not reflect that on the date you got your green card approval, it was not then your intent to work for this employer. I've discussed this issue earlier, but I'll do it one more time real quickly. So let's say I'm working for IBM and I got my green card approval today. A week later, if I quit, the only issue is on the date I, I got my green card, which is today, did I have the intention to stay with them for an undefined period? That's what permanent intention means. It doesn't mean forever. It means that I had the intention to stay with them for an indefinite period. Make sense? So therefore, if you quit after a week, that's okay as long as you were not already packing your bags. If you get a better job offer, why not? If you want to do your own job, your own work, independent contracting, why not? If you want to change fields, why not? So after you get your green card approval, you can do all of those things. It should not affect your citizenship application. And I don't see what documentation you need to maintain. Nothing really. Only thing that could come up is what was your intention on the date you got your green card. So for instance, if you rented an apartment or if you bought a place near your work, Maintaining some documentation about that is evidence that you intended to stay there, but then you got a really good job or you decided to go on to your own work uh, later on. At least on the date you got your green card, there was no intention to leave. Star five, if you have a follow-up question on this, no new questions, any follow-up question on this? Press star five on your phone. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Now, I just want to make sure that you guys can hear me okay. Let's just uh, confirm that one time. The conference is now in conversation mode. Uh, can you all hear me okay, guys? Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, sir. Excellent. 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 Thank you. Yes. Thank the you. conference is now in presentation mode. Next question is getting H-1B extensions based upon I-140 approval of spouse. It does not work like that. So if my wife and I are both here on H-1B, or even if I'm on H-4, she gets her I-140 approval, but my H-1B six years are over, I cannot extend my H-1B based upon her I-140 approval. I cannot. So my wife's I-140 was approved and I was also on her I-140, my nonprofit employer filed my perm, it's pending with USCIS. If I have to switch employers before I-140 approval and pending 180 days, I'm assuming that my new employer would have to file my green card all over again. The answer is yes. So if you leave before the I-140 is, up, before even the perm is approved, you will not get anything out of that process. If you leave after I-140 approval, you still have to start your green card all over again but you definitely carry with you your priority date. On top of that, you may also be able to carry your right to extend H-1B with any employer um, as long as the I-140 was approved and stayed approved for 180 days. After that, even if it is revoked by the old employer, your rights are not disturbed. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, press star five on your telephone. Oh, there's another question here. Oh, you are here already. So you can just, uh, let's see, this is from Minnesota. Minnesota, go ahead, please. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Go ahead. 
So my question, my question here is, if I change employers and my job roles, uh, once I have my own forty approved, can I do that? Oh yes, oh yes. Job roles. Oh oh yes. You see, when you change your employers during the green card process, there are three possible stages. One, you leave before even the perm is approved. You get nothing. I one forty not approved. You get nothing. If the I-140 is approved, you definitely get your priority date the moment the I-140 is approved. After 180 days, you also get your right to extend H1, uh, H-1B with any employer. The third situation is, if your I-140 is approved, priority date become current, you file your I-485, and after 180 days you change your employer, or for 180 days it was not questioned, what is called AC-21 uh, portability. There are, these are three different situations. In the AC21 portability, which is 485 pending 180 days, you have to have same or similar job. But as far as I-140 priority date is concerned or I-140 right to extend H-1B is concerned, you do not have to have the same job. To give you an example, let's say that I have a degree, for example, my first degree is in biology and chemistry, and I have a, a few degrees in law, and I decide, you know what, I'm tired of being a lawyer, I want to be a scientist. So let's say my I-140 was approved as a lawyer. If I want to take my next job as a scientist, I carry both my priority date as well as the right to extend my H-1. However, I will not be able to carry the AC-21 portability because that job is not same or similar. Does that make sense? Yep, so I have to wait 180 days after my I-140 approval actually, to change no. my buyers actually, or... actually, no. If you leave and the employer does not revoke for 180 days, that's what is required. It isn't, oh, okay. it isn't required okay. that you continue working with them for 180 days. Oh, okay. So okay. if I leave after perm and between I-140, what is the sequence? Well, if, look, this, this gets tricky and we get into this situation. So let's say your employer was our client and they called me and they said, Rajiv, uh, our Minnesota friend wants to leave, uh, but his perm is pending. Uh, but we do want to continue with the green card process. We might hire him back. It is our intention to hire him back. In that case, even if you leave, they can still file your I-140. And once it gets approved, you have your priority date forever. And if it stays approved for 180 days, then you have your right to extend H-1B forever. So the answer is, if the I-140 is never filed, you get nothing. If it is filed, approved, you get priority date. If it is filed approved and stays approved 180 days, you get your right to extend H-1B even if you left while the perm was still pending. Oh, okay. Make sense? Yep, yep. yep. And also in the first case, so if, right. uh, if I'm on my wife's I-140, I don't have the right to get the H-1B approved. No, uh, sir. No, sir. Not so, based upon your spouse. Yeah. Yeah, so I have to have be I have to have my own green card process started to get the H one B approved after six years. Exactly. Okay. Oh, sorry. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, let's go on to the next frequently asked question. This is a tough one, though, guys. This is about CPT OPT unlawful presence. So let me talk about this. I've talked about it last time also, but let's do it one more time because this is a complicated issue. It used to be that government said, I'm going to break it down. There's actually many complications in this, but I'm going to break it down into very simple uh, parts that are important. Leave aside some other parts. So government didn't have this, this idea that your CPT should be limited in time. So you could get an OPT after that. Let's say you did one master's degree in information systems. You got one year of OPT and no CPT, let's say. Then you got another degree uh, another master's degree in computer science while you are in the in the computer science degree both are masters you could get cpt for unlimited duration you don't get opt again at the same level but you can get unlimited cpt now government is saying we will not give you cpt at the same level cpt opt combined should be 12 months so if i took let's say three months of cpt they will give me opt at the first degree only for nine more months. In the second degree, no OPT, no CPT. Okay, so 
they have changed their interpretation from unlimited CPT to CPT OPT combined no more than 12 months at one education level. When you go to PhD, you can get another 12 months of CPT OPT combined. Now this, this I believe has been challenged a couple of times. The problem is this creates a very difficult situation. These are two, three different areas, moving parts that we don't really know what to do with. Why? Because they have a memorandum that says unlawful presence begins for students upon the date they violate their status. And they have a memo that came out effective August 9th. But let's just presume we are past August 9th of last year. So let's assume that if you're, there's a break in your status, if you took CPT, isn't that a break in your status? Probably is. Are they going to hold you to, um, to unlawful presence, which means after 180 days, you cannot come back for three years. Actually, you can through something called a 212D3 waiver. Remember that also, 212D3 waiver. But it's really very difficult to counsel our, our clients and our community members. What do I tell you? It's already in the past. It may be already almost a year since, uh, well, August 9th is when the memo kicks in. So this August, if you have broken your CPT requirements, let's say August 9th, this August 9th, it will be 2019, it will be one year. So then you become subject to the 10 year bar. You are already subject to the to the three year bar because it's more than 180 days. So I don't know what to tell you. All I can tell you is going forward, if you have a choice, avoid CPT OPT combo until the litigation is won. I think there is a litigation pending in North Carolina uh, filed by two universities. I don't remember if it is on this issue. I think it's on this issue. No, I think it's on the issue of unlawful presence. That's right, unlawful presence. What I think what the lawsuit said was, I have it, uh, I have a copy of the lawsuit. Uh, I think what the lawsuit said was that if you want to change, make a big change like this, you have to do it through regulations. You can't just post a notice. And I think government is going to lose that case. I think we're going to be okay. But till that time, I really don't know what to tell you. All I can say is, go on if you want, or whatever has happened has happened. Uh, next decision is August 9th of, or August 8th of uh, 2019. Before that, you have to make a decision whether you want to take a, take a chance with a 10 year bar or just go outside USA, come back with a visa. That way you don't have 180, more than, uh, I'm sorry, more than 180 is less than, um, uh, more than 180 is less than one year. So there's a three year bar or a 10 year bar. I know it's a little garbled, but I'm trying to um, cover up as many ways I can. So what Manglesh wanted to know was, I have used my CPT for more than one year at same master's level. Unlawful should be unlawful presence would be counted from six months from Feb 2019, which is August 5th. Yeah, that's the way I looked at it. Actually, it's August 9th not August 5th. So what are my options and what can I tell you? What I am telling our clients is that if you've already done it and you're okay with a three-year bar potentiality uh, with a, again another potentiality of a 212D3 waiver which should be given in cases like this where they let you take a non-immigrant visa even though you have a three-year bar and the way it works is let's say I got a three-year bar. I go to get my H1B visa. Government consulate says, sorry, we can't give you H-1B visa because you have a three-year bar. But then I say, okay, give me a 212D3 waiver and they give me a 212D3 waiver, rather easily given. I don't know under Trump administration, but it was easily given earlier and should be again. I come back to USA after three years, I'm free of the bar. So I can be working on H-1B in the USA with a 212D3 waiver and get rid of the bar. So it's not like I have to be outside USA, okay? So that's the way it works. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. Star five. I don't have a lot of clarity to offer you, Mangleshi, because there isn't a whole lot of clarity. It's a matter of judgment, how much risk you want to take. If you have been in violation of status, you're already subject to three-year bar, counting August 9th uh, last year. But August 9th of next year or, or August 8th of next this year, you will be subject to then 10-year bar. You might have to make a decision during that time. There is a follow-up question, I guess, from Maryland. Maryland, go ahead, please. Maryland? Uh, 
Good afternoon, sir. My name is Mukesh, and this is a question just same as unlawful presence, but it's not for OPT or CPT. Uh, it's for an H4 visa. Okay. Go ahead. It's okay. So, uh, sir, my yes, I will go ahead. So, my uh, H1 was expired last year in July, uh, and you know, when I did my uh, employer transfer, so I got approved for three years. My H1B was approved, approved, but you know, unfortunately, we forgot to. Uh, file my uh, wife's uh, extension. So my wife's and daughter's S4 extension was not filed. Mm -hmm. We just got to know before like couple of weeks that you know we have forgotten and the moment we realized that you know uh, that her because their I-94 and visa was expired on September 15, 2018 which was last year. So I talked to, to my employer and they said you know because it's still not 180 days they can do that month protocol or something but oh, no, you know because they are close on, to their 180 on, days. Hang on, hang on. It's called yes. nunc pro tunc. Nunc pro tunc simply means oh. retroactive status. However, the risk, sir, is this. Because H4s yes. are taking so long, by the time the case is decided, it might already be that they are over one year unlawfully present. Then they would be subject to 10-year bar. Correct. So uh, I was advised that you know they should leave the country immediately, go back and just get their uh, visa stamped, and they should be fine. So you know my uh, they left on last week, last week two like February sixteenth, right. and their one hundred and eighty days was over on March fourteenth. So they left almost before a month. Yeah, yeah, so, no problem. Uh, my question, no problem. You'll be fine. So there should not be an issue, right? And uh, sir, one thing, I'm uh, trying to get the visa. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to get their appointment. And DS-160, that is a question which says, you know, that have you overstayed or okay, have you been on, a hang on, hang, on, hang on one second. I cannot help you fill forms. Yes. That's, uh, yes, that's problematic. But I can give you general information. Somebody in this situation has been both out of status as well as unlawfully present. So if anybody ever asks you, have you been out of status? Yes. Have you been unlawfully present? Yes. What is the reason? Because we forgot to file my H4 by mistake, but we left before 180 days. Okay. Okay. That's good, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Good luck. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. So that's that. Now let's go on to the next one. And this is, all, you know, this is an easy one from Gaurav uh, who says, can I file a green card? He's working for um, MNC, which is, I guess it's a big company uh, in India. But they, can they file my green card in USA while I'm working for them? And the answer is yes. After this, I have joined a new firm. Can my current company or a new company... Yeah, actually, uh, let's forget MNC for a second. Let's say that uh, we have an office in India, right? So we've got some lawyers working there. And I decide, you know what? I want to sponsor one of our lawyers from India to come and work here. Uh, and it's not urgent, but over the next 8, 10 years, I want them to come here. I can start their green card based upon intention to hire them in the future. There's absolutely no problem with that. So any company, as long as it is done in good faith, honest intentions to hire and to be hired, they can file your green card while you are living in India. Only problem is, if you try to get a tourist visa or a business visa, because you have a green card pending, there might be a problem. They might not give that to you. But that is not a problem for H1 or L1 type visas. Okay. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question. Star 5. So filing while you're in India is no problem at all. Well, I guess this is from India. Okay. Yeah, India, go ahead, please. I can hear you. India. Hello, India, go ahead. India, you've been unmuted. Go ahead, say hello. Okay. Um, I'm leaving you unmuted. I'm hoping that you can talk to me. Okay, so our frequently answered, asked questions are all answered. Let's go to the routine questions that we have, non-frequently asked questions. Uh, India, for some reason, you may want to hang up and call back in again and then press star five. I'm not able to hear you, okay? So let's go to the routine questions. The first one is from 
S. Kulkarni. I'm on H1B working with the same company for eight years. I-140 is approved. Current H1B expires September 5th. Renewal comes up in March. Wife works on H4 EAD. Her EAD is up for renewal too. Her company has also filed an H1B cap case. Should we convert her H1B into premium processing or wait for some time? I think premium processing would be a good idea. Yeah. Should I file an H4 extension in EAD? See, the problem with EAD is, H4 based EAD is there's no grace period. So if the H4 EAD expires, she cannot start working until the second one is approved. So I, it's common sense, not really legal. It looks to me like filing H1 or premiuming the H1B case is a good idea. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, star five. Okay, this one is from, I'm not doing any new, oh, this is probably India. India is calling, okay. Yeah, India, go ahead, we can hear you. India? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Hi, Ravi, so can you hear me? Yes, sir, very well, actually. All right, thank you. Also, thank you for addressing the question. So, uh, you said uh, it, it's for future employment, it can be raised. So, I just wanted to understand, if I raise, uh, my company starts a green card, for me now, uh, how soon can I uh, come and work in US? Is it so, so the time frame that you mentioned is it eight, ten years, or um, basically is it only after GC is approved? Then yeah. can I travel? Or yeah, that green okay. card, that green card is a long term plan. It cannot be basis for immediate employment. So in your case, six years were almost over. What you will do is you will start your green card with this company. And once the green card has been going for for uh, one year, you can then file for an H-1B for at least one year. Whether or not you are subject to the quota would have to be determined at that point of time. But you cannot come to USA for many years, eight, ten years probably, uh, based upon the green card filing. You'll have to rely upon H-1B or L-1. Another thing you can think of is very important is if you're a managerial or executive level employee, you can come in on an L1A visa which has no quota restriction. On top of that, that leads you directly to EB1C. In fact, you don't even have to use L1A if you are a manager level person. You can directly file a green card under EB1C category while the current green card is also going on. So, and for executive and managerial level employees, there are many more options. Does that make sense? Yes, understood. Yes, that is okay. All right. Thank Good you. Luck. You're welcome. Okay. So let's go. Where was I? We were doing, we did the question about premium processing of H1, H4. Now we are at Krish 176. This is uh, my green card labor priority date is December 2009. So what happened was he got his EAD and advance parole in one card for two years, but his wife got EAD card for one year only and a separate parole document for two years. What you should do is you should contact USCIS. I'm not sure why they did that. They should give her an EAD for two years, I think. So open a service request by calling USCIS customer service. So as far as travel outside is concerned, there is no problem. You can use that to travel outside. You can definitely file EAD application again uh, 180 days before, before expiration of the current EAD. And the difference between H4 EAD and I-485 EAD is she can continue working for another 180 days after her EAD expires. So. She can apply 180 days ahead, then EAD expires. She can continue working while the EAD is pending for another 180 days. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, star five. Okay. This is from Arjun, currently in India on a re-entry permit, so filing N-470. I can't help you fill the forms. 
I'll be attaching a copy of green card, travel document, employment letter. Usually it's the employment letter that's the most important thing. Just follow the instructions on the form. I can't tell you if the documents are sufficient. I can't help you prepare the package. Uh, that would be unethical. I have to actually sign off on the paperwork. But basically the most important part is to prove that you are working for a U.S. subsidiary of a U.S. owned company or working to advance the interest of a U.S. owned company. I can't help you with the rest. Just follow the instructions, Arjun. Star 5 if you have any other question. Press star 5 if you have any other question. Okay, this is India. India, go ahead, please. I can hear you. Hello, Rajivji. Uh, Arjun here from India. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks for answering my question. Of course. Can you hear me okay? Yes, very well, actually. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. So, uh, the in terms of uh, the, once I mail my info some somebody from India, for the will there be a biometric appointment needed uh, or not? You know, I don't uh, know. Or, uh, I I don't know what the for one thirty one you definitely need a biometric appointment. Four seventy I don't think you do. But please don't hold me to that because I don't remember at this level of detail. What I would suggest you do is go, okay. on, go online to uscis.gov and read their procedures. That mm. should tell you exactly what you need to do. USCIS website has actually come okay. along very nicely. Okay. And if you still can't find okay. the information, okay. you can try sending me an email to help at immigration.com. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So actually, I went through uh, I, uh, N470 instruction document right. and it says that if needed, uh, there may be a biometric appointment. And that can be taken in a local U.S. consulate. That's, that's what the instruction that's, document that's says. You already, also, you already know more about the procedures than I do, Arjunji. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. One thing is I'm not, I was not sure if it's, if it's needed for every application or on a case-by-case -case basis. That's one thing I was not sure. That's okay. And uh, I, I'm just have a follow-up question based on the same subject. So I, I moved to India in February 2018 on a re-entry permit. So my re-entry permit actually was valid from February 2017 to February 13, 2019. So it got expired uh, just a week ago. Okay. However, I, I was on my company uh, visit in August last year. So so it's although it's expired, can I still apply for re-entry permit you'll and get to, the re-entry for next have to come two back. more years? You'll have to come back to USC. See, I'm concerned. If your re-entry permit expired and you have not been in, in the U.S. for the last one year, that could affect your green no. card. So uh, let's talk a little bit about this. I'm trying to figure out uh, how would this work. Okay. So when was the last time okay. you were in U.S., Arjun? I, I was in U.S.A. August 2018 for two, for, for two weeks. So I came on a business visit and a personal trip. September, October, November, December, January, February, March. So probably more than six months. The, the problem is, so you were okay, you were covered by the re-entry permit for this amount of time, but should you not come back, I would advise you very strongly to make a trip to the USA as quickly as possible. Come to USA, okay. apply for a re-entry permit, do your biometrics, and then leave. Your new re-entry permit can be sent to either a U.S. consulate in India where you can pick it up or it can be sent to any address of your choosing in the USA from where it can be sent to you mm. or to your lawyers. Okay. 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 Uh, thanks. I was planning on that but one thing is what I know is I have to come to U.S. to mail my re-entry permit application right. and the actual appoint for, appointment for biometrics can take up to a month to get the yeah, five, five That's what happens last time. Five weeks. But you can ask for an expedite so, who might give it to you. Uh, you can also do this, uh, okay. Arjun. You can file the application, leave USA, okay. and come back for biometrics. Okay, okay. That's what I was planning to do, but is there any way that you said I can file the application and ask for expedite and can, uh, within a week, can I just walk in over to, to local uh, uh, UCI center and uh, walk in and I, get it to my I, apartment then or... Look, application support centers have done favors for people. They do it all the time. You can certainly try. Without the receipt, I think it will be very difficult. And it might take a long time to get the receipt. But no harm in checking with the application support center. 
Okay. Uh, but the right procedure is to mail the, go to US just for, can I, can I mail the application from India? No, no, no. You have to be physically in the USA when the government receives your application. Uh, okay. Are uh, physically in the US, so I can, I can do a courier from US. Okay. Yeah, I would FedEx okay. it or, okay, then, or UPS it just to keep track of the application. Okay, I see. So I have to do, uh, make a trip two times. Right. Okay, that's the, okay, okay, I'll do that. Right. I'll do that. I think, uh, but, I, uh, but I, I'm just a little worried because it's expired, but since uh, uh, I have all the documentation, I have a letter from my uh, employer, and uh, I've been in the U.S. for 10 years before I left. So I have all the documentation, I have a letter from my company. So I'm hoping that uh, even though my uh, reentry permit got expired, but because of all this documentation, and, uh, and I've, uh, I know I'm, I'm, I also would have already applied file for N-470, which I can ask still to the visa office, the, the port of yeah, entry office N, that I N, can N, come N, back. N-470 and I-131 not mutually exchangeable. They're different things. I got to go on to my next question, Arjun. Okay. Good luck. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next question. Let's see. So I'm currently working as a full-time employee with employer A. B has transferred my H1. Approval is from Monday. So what is happening is my last approval expired two days before my new approval begins. Is this a problem? Zero problem. Don't worry about it. It's perfectly fine. Star five, if there is any issue, any question about this, star five. This is no issue at all, don't worry about it. Jay Anand, I'm currently on H1B working as a full-time employee for an employer who's a federal contractor in the DC area. So they didn't get paid. They didn't get paid while the government was closed. Can the employer fix this by issuing back pay? Yes, they can. They, their responsibility to pay you doesn't, doesn't stop. If the employer does not want to pay me and fires me, what are my options legally? You really cannot do much. You'll have to find a job within 60 days. Due to the pay issues, if I want to transfer my H-1B to a new employer, will the missed paycheck be a problem? All you can do is uh, request the government to consider the extraordinary circumstances that there is this Trump's fake um, crisis that he has created. So it's not really your fault it extraordinary circumstances beyond your control you can certainly shoot for that i think you'll be okay star five if you have a follow-up question star five okay i'm currently on an approved this is from dikshit i'm currently on an approved a cap exempt h1b working full time if a cap subject employer files an H-1B, will this be counted towards the visa lottery? Yeah, you have to go through the lottery. You cannot file for a, if you're working for a cap exempt and you want to go to a capped employer, a quota employer, you have to go through the lottery system. However, interestingly, if you are with a cap exempt employer, but you want to do a concurrent H-1 simultaneously with the cap employer, you can do that without going through the quota, but you gotta keep both jobs. Yeah, so I think I've, I've covered your questions. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, star five. Next question is from Ruchika. Planning to go to India March 5th through 18th. Transfer was applied December 7th. I'm assuming that's H-1B transfer. Can I travel on my previously stamped visa? Yes, you can. With my current receipt, yes, you can. What do I say when they ask the name of my employer? Whoever you're working for. You can actually be not working at all in between transfers. So if you have, as soon as the transfer was, a, was filed, started working for the new employer, that's your employer. But if the transfer is pending, you're still working for the old employer, then that's your employer. It depends upon um, what your situation is. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, star five. Okay. I'm actually surprised. I thought I had a lot of questions that I won't, I won't be able to cover, but we went through it very quickly. Uh, Krishna says, I'm looking for my old H-1B approved petitions, looking at my old petitions. Again, there's a gap. On December 31st, 2015 is missing. 
So first one was valid. So there's one month gap. This is absolutely no problem. If there is a gap between two H-1B approvals and you have received your status while within USA, there is no issue at all. Don't worry about it. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. Okay. And the last posted question is about 214B denials. So guys, when somebody gets a 214B denial, it is extremely difficult to overcome it because it's a judgment of the government, of the, of the consular officer, that this person who's applying for a non-immigrant visa has no intention of coming back. Very difficult to overcome. We have overcome it every now and then, but very unusual circumstances. So if your F1, F2 stamps were not successful, the only way you can, you can get into USA is probably H4, which doesn't have a 214B problem. H1, H4, L1, L2, um, E1s, O1s don't have this problem. I can't tell you how to overcome your, your 214B denial. The only other way, it, the way cases where we were successful was when somebody had already been in the US, left a couple of times within time, and this was a long time back, and we were able to overcome that 214B denial. But these are very difficult to overcome. I think you're gonna to have to wait for his H1B, H4 to come through. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, star five. Okay, guys, I have time, about 10 minutes for any new questions. So press star five if you have a question, any question. Star five. Let's see how many we can do. So I have right now only one question, one hand raised. Are you guys sure? Okay, two, three, four. Okay. Are you sure there are only four questions? Okay, because I'll, I'll not do any more after that. Very good. Well, five. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Five is it. Five it is. I'll do the, these five uh, and please try to try to make them as short as possible. Ask your question, but let's try not to uh, not to spend too much time on any one issue. Let's start with uh, Virginia. Virginia, go ahead. You have a question. Virginia. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Hi. Um, so my question is, um, do I have to file for uh, I three one three one to re-enter the country if I intend to move permanently to the U.S. in the next few months? If you intend to move permanently to the U.S., do, I, do you have to file 131? Is that your question? Yes, because I still have to leave to go back to the U.K. Um, and then come back. So do I have to file? No, 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 no. I, I it do doesn't one. work like that. Do you have a green card okay. to live in U.S.A.? Yes. You yes, have I a do. green card? Yes. Okay. So you want to go back to U.K. and never come back to U.S.A.? No, no, no. I want to go back to the UK to, because um, I, I plan to come back to the US to live permanently. I need to go and um, tidy up some things in the UK before coming back. How long would you be gone for, ma'am? Um, a couple of months, about like two months. Actually, a couple of months, you don't even need 131. It's only if you're going to be gone for six months or more, I would suggest uh, you file 131. A okay. couple of months is okay. No problem. Okay. Okay, so I only asked because on my way in this time, um, I was told that um, there might be an issue if I don't file that. Oh, um, if, you, if you have a history yeah. of not staying in USA, they can take away your green card. If, you have, a, if okay. you have a history of coming and going, just coming for a couple of months here and there, they'll take away your green card. Yes. Okay. Okay. If you have that kind of history, I want you to do a one-on-one -on -one consultation with a lawyer. Sit down, go over your history, and okay. see what they suggest. Okay? Okay. All right. Good, okay. good luck. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Let's go on to the next question. This is from Illinois. Illinois, go ahead. I can hear you. Illinois. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, uh, my name is Nisar, and uh, last year I asked you a question regarding my I-45 and you suggested that I should uh, file my I-45 before my I-94 uh, expires. So it's expiring uh, this 28th February. So I filed, I sent my document to USCIS uh, 
this Tuesday. So my question is, uh, if uh, I won't get any response from USCIS by 28th Feb, so is it fine? Okay, like, let me let uh, me ask you. Uh, you said your I-94 is still valid, right? Yes. Okay. What is your current status? Are you on an H-1B? Yeah, I am on H-1B okay, and hang on, hang on, I on. already applied for uh, extension. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I am um, trying to focus our discussion to make sure I get it right. So, your priority date was current, you could file a 485? Correct. Yeah, that's okay. right. Look, here is how it works. You are protected from different angles for different things. First of all, you are protected from status by both the 485 filing as well as the extension filing. When an extension is filed, you can continue working for up to 240 days as long as it was filed before the status yeah. expired. Okay? Yeah. So that's yeah. number one protection. Also, once 485 is filed either within status or within 180 days, uh, off status again I'm being a little simple I don't know all the facts of your case you are again protected okay. your status is protected but you don't have any right to work your right to work is coming from the extension once your EAD is approved then you'll have the right to work so overall there is no problem you're fine okay 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 yeah. thank you Good thank luck. you sir you're welcome all right let's go on uh, we have another question from India. India, go ahead, please. India. India. Okay, I'm going to leave you open. Hello. Yeah, yeah. go ahead, ma'am. I can hear you. Uh, hi, Mr. Rajiv. Um, I just wanted to know if there are any options for me uh, to come on tourist visa because I was denied the F2 dependent as well as F1 visa. It's 214B denial. Uh, is it worth trying to do? 214B yeah. denial will pretty much cover all visas where uh, immigrant intent is an issue, including B1, J1, F1, F2, uh, B2. You can try, but I don't think they're going to give it to you. Either qualify for an H1, okay. L1, L2, mm -hmm. H4, or wait until you are qualified. You can try again if you like. Okay. Have you been to USA before? So if I try and get the rejected again or will it lead to a problem in my no, as, long, or if I, as, uh, as long as you don't make any misrepresentations you can be denied a thousand mm -hmm. times it's not a problem uh, okay yeah thank okay. you so much oh, I, have, I have a quick question for you have you been to USA before mm -hmm. yes I was in the US uh, for one and a half years on F2 visa Okay. I came here for some personal reasons. I want to go back and now I'm not, not you know, able. That, that sounds a little unreasonable. Maybe you should get yourself a lawyer. Because what the lawyers can do is they can write to the, to, to the consulate saying, what has changed? You gave her an F2 before, what has changed? She doesn't, didn't violate her mm -hmm. status. And if they say okay. no, at least it may not work, but the lawyer can try escalating the case to the visa office in Washington, D.C. It's worth a try. Okay? Okay, okay, yeah. Good luck to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, and we have the last two questions now. This one is from California. California, I can hear you. Go ahead, please. Hi, hello, sir. Uh, I have a question on I-140. So right now, I'm on H-1B. Right. And I have an approved, approved I-140 from my previous employer, and that's current. Uh, now, my new employer did not start my green card process yet. So my question is, if I join back the previous employer, uh, from which from whom I have the approved I-140, and my I-140 uh, priority date is current, uh, do I need to still apply for an H-1B, or can I directly do the adjustment? No. The thing is, you can file adjustment if they intend to hire you or, and you intend to be hired back, but you should discuss with uh -huh. your lawyers. There are ramifications because one of the questions, common sense questions is, why did you leave if you wanted to stay with them? So I think you should talk with your lawyers, but theoretically, it is possible to file the 485 without, without joining them right away. Theoretically, yes, it can be done. No problem. Oh, I see. So if I, if I, if I accept the offer from them, uh, do I have two options? The first option is to renew the uh, uh, transfer the H-1B 
the second one is uh, just directly try the 485 that is correct but it should not be done okay. without having a good consultation conversation with your lawyers okay okay thank you sir certainly thank possible you. good luck thank you and the last question of the day is from arizona arizona go ahead please Hi Rajiv, uh, this is kind of follow up to the question number 13. I uh, currently joined a new employer based on the receipt notice and my old employer has uh, withdrawn the petition of 797. Now when I'm traveling back to US, shall I show my new 797 receipt because it's not approved as and enter the country with my old visa stamp? That is correct, that's what you do. And will not will there be any issues uh, uh, if I do that? See, I don't like answering that question. Will there be any issues? But will there be any issues because you have a withdrawn H one B from from the prior employer and a receipt from the new employer? That's not a problem. You should be allowed entry. That fact by itself is not an issue. Okay, got it. And a follow-up question is like, my wife uh, wants to travel back, so can she travel back with the old one because she has not applied any transfer at? Yes, absolutely. Because H4 is tied to you, it isn't tied to your employer. Okay, got it. Thank, Thank you very much, Rajiv. Oh, you're very welcome. Very good, guys. We did well. We went through all the questions pretty quickly. So... This is the end of our call today. I will see you in a, again in two weeks. I enjoy, really, really enjoy talking with all of you. Come back, we'll talk again in two weeks. Bye-bye. Every other Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we host um, free community conference calls. Everybody is welcome to join. Some people post questions ahead of time. You can take membership in our forums. Uh, all of the details are there on our website, immigration.com. You can take membership uh, ahead of time and, um, you know, it's instantaneous. It happens right away and post your questions beforehand or you can just log in. Uh, the phone number and all are provided 202-800-8394-1230 Eastern Standard Time every other Thursday. We have uh, free apps for both Apple iOS platform for your iPhones and iPads as well as for Android. Just look for immigration.com, immigration.com, the period dot, and uh, the application should show up.